Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? My guest today is Matt Stoller. Matt is the Director of Research at the American Economic Liberties Project and the author of Goliath, a book about the history of monopoly power and the efforts by citizens and the government to restrain it. He publishes regularly at mattstoller.substack.com, and you're about to learn in today's nearly two-hour-long conversation how monopoly commercial concentration, and regulatory capture by the most powerful interests in American life drive outcomes in our economy, markets, and political system, and what we can do to take that power back. This episode was recorded on Friday, May 29th, in the afternoon in the midst of the riots that have been unfolding in Minneapolis and across the rest of the country in response to the death of George Floyd, a 46-year-old African-American father of two girls, aged 6 and 22, who appears on video to have been suffocated by Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, who was applying pressure to Mr. Floyd's neck for somewhere between eight to nine minutes, almost three of which were reportedly after he had already become unresponsive. Chauvin is now in custody. A coroner's report has been issued. It's already sparking controversy. And this, unfortunately, is a very familiar story for America's black community and for the rest of us who are struggling to understand what we have to do in order to fix it. It must be absolutely heartbreaking for George's family, his daughters, his siblings, to know that the person they love was killed while lying face down on the concrete, not resisting, begging to breathe. Neither Matt or I are in any position to provide further insight into what is transpiring in Minneapolis, but we do discuss the response by some members of the media, the White House, as well as the president's statement that he's going to issue an executive order to roll back legal protections against social media companies for making editorial decisions and censoring content on the internet. We also discuss the Joe Rogan Spotify deal in the context of antitrust regulation and concentration in the podcast industry, the arrest of a CNN crew in Minneapolis, and what it means for freedom of information and the press, private equity and the regulatory capture of government by the financial sector, and perhaps most importantly, a conversation about the future of the democratic and Republican parties, and whether we are living through the early stages of a new political consensus forming in American life. And with that, please enjoy yet another timely and important conversation with my guest, Matt Stoller. Matt, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure having you on. I spent the last few days reading Goliath on audiobook at 1.5x, which I don't <laughs> I don't prefer to do that. But I'm trying to find a way to balance with this job, my desire to read everyone's book with the the constraints on my time. So what I've discovered is the best strategy in most cases, especially when someone's book is as big as yours, is that I'll, I'll read it on audiobook and then I'll get the PDF and I'll scan through the PDF afterwards to mark up areas that I thought were more interesting or reread them. And I'm also familiar with much of the early history that you write about, much less familiar with the history of deregulation in the 50s, 60s, 
and very early 70s, though I was fortunate to have read, I'm blanking now on his name, The uh, American Theocracy. Kevin Phillips wrote a book right. called American Theocracy back in the day, and he covered deregulation of the financial sector as one of his three kind of pillars of the book. And that began with Jimmy Carter's Monetary Control Act in 1979. So I'm familiar with kind of the bookends of that history, but not all of it. And then I also spent the week reading everything that you've written in the last few months. And you publish a lot of stuff on your blog. What's the URL of that? How do people yeah, find your so, stuff? Uh, the book is called Goliath, The Hundred-Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy. I also write a newsletter called Big, and you can get both the, the newsletter and the book or get more information at mattstoller.com. So M-A-T-T-S-T-O-L-L-E-R.com. So what do you write about on your blog and what is Goliath about? So I write about the problem of monopoly power, private power. There are two basic parts of politics. One of them is what we have explicitly recognized as political, which are social questions like flag burning or speech or the ability to have personal, you know, keep our thoughts to ourselves or communicate with others. The other are commercial questions. So what, what we once called industrial liberty. And since really since the early 1980s, we have subordinated those commercial questions to a set of technocratic experts, which we call economists. But we've said the Fed knows what it's doing. We have people who deal with uh, regulations at a place called the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. Legislation is scored by economists at the Congressional Budget Office. And we sort of walled off resource allocation in most ways. There's a little bit of places we fight about it. But market structure, monetary policy, we've walled those off from democratic forces. And my writing is to recenter politics around that and to say, no, it's not a realm of experts. It's for everyone to debate and fight over. So my book, Goliath, is the history. It's sort of a loose biography of a congressman named Wright Patman, who's not well known today, but was really famous in his day. He was in Congress from 1929 to 1976. And his whole goal was to fight against high interest rates, monopolies, special interests, and big banks. And how he did it, and the, the, the kind of gang fight of the New Deal in the 30s between the forces of democracy and the forces of monopoly, and how that played out all the way into the 1970s. I start before Patman got into Congress. So I start in 1910, and then I extend into 2008. But that story explains, I think, a lot of why we were completely surprised when the financial crisis happened. We didn't know how to think about the problem as political because we hadn't seen banks as political institutions before that, and why we're having such trouble as society addressing what are problems today in our supply chains and our commercial institutions. So that's what I write about. And then I started big because I wanted to honestly market Goliath, but it's become really fun. And what I write, I have a couple tens of thousands of readers now, and I write about monopolies and I write about the politics of finance and the politics of monopoly power. So and it changes every week. This week, I wrote about a cheerleading monopoly. So there's a private equity-owned company called Varsity Brands, which controls, weirdly enough, the cheerleading market. And they do it using tactics that are reminiscent of what John D. Rockefeller did with Standard Oil, rebates and coercive tactics and vertical iteration, things like that. And it's gotten huge pickup in the cheerleading community. You know, I also write about technology platforms. I write about hospital mergers and hospital consolidation. I write about, and I try to give some history. I've written a lot about the origins of, of the modern private equity industry and what they do and how they're structuring our response to the pandemic. So just try to kind of recenter our politics around, around commerce and around production. I also write a lot about China and the supply chains and our economic integration with China. So that's what I do, and it's fun. Yeah, our listeners would really enjoy your stuff. There's actually a really strong intersection. But I think what's interesting about your work is that you come at it from a very strong progressive angle, which is something that we don't often cover. But I think that what's happening, and this is one of the things I want to talk to you about, is I think that a new political consensus is in the very early stages of forming. I think we still have a long way to go. But in this sense, I think that it is less relevant than ever before to think about – 
economics or civil liberties strictly in terms of standard political dichotomies. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, but I also want to ask you as well, which is how you got interested in monopoly and covering this stuff. Like, when did you first learn about Wright Patman? Both great questions. Yeah, I completely agree. I think there's a new consensus forming. It is in its early stages. And I do think that we have a problem where we don't think about social justice in the context of our commercial institutions. So there was this really important moment in 2016 where Hillary Clinton was talking at a debate with Bernie Sanders, and she said to him, would breaking up the banks end racism? And it was not a question, it was more of a weapon, right? To say there is a, we have to make a choice between addressing this social question of race relations and this institutional question of banking institutions. Like those are completely separate and one has nothing to do with the other. And I think that one of the things that we're seeing is, of course, that's not true. The main way or a really key way that Americans relate to one another and with, to people all over the world is through commerce, through lending, through credit decisions, through the way we buy and sell to each other. And if you don't think that racism or anti-racism or any of these other questions, gender relationships also manifests itself and is reinforced in all of these commercial relationships, then I think that you're sort of missing a big part of how our society works. And so what I was trying to do is, you know, and I think a lot of the hyperventilating that we have around social issues is actually related to the fact that people don't situate them in an institutional context and are just like, no, this is all just a result of, you know, the other side being a bunch of bad people versus my side being a bunch of good people. And then they scream at each other instead of actually looking into the institutional basis for why we have a divided society or for why we have certain social problems. And it's just, it's much more fundamentally satisfying to understand the bureaucracies and to understand the market structure that drives power instead of to just scream at other people about it. But I guess it's, there's a sort of, you know, screaming and just feeling morally superior, I guess does give you a kind of temporary high but that's not what I like, and so it's not what I enjoy. It's like eating junk food all the time. So I got into politics because of the war in Iraq, and I was a supporter of the war in Iraq in 2002, and I got really, I was fooled. I, I was an idiot, and I wanted to understand why I had gone so wrong. And so eventually I started working in democratic politics and said, oh, it's all the Republicans' fault. And then I realized that actually maybe the Democrats had some problems too. Eventually I went and I was like, I need to learn how the system works and how government works. So I started working in Congress during the financial crisis. And that's when I really started to understand, I think, as I think a lot of us did, that, oh, these banks and corporations are not neutral technocratic institutions. I mean, it sounds kind of quaint now, but that is actually how people thought about the world before the financial crisis. And not everybody, but a lot of people did. And so then you, you learn, you're like, oh, wait a second, foreclosures and private equity and all of these kind of questions about resources are, these are political questions and they, they work through these institutions called banks and corporations and regulations and antitrust law. And the woman who taught me about banking law when the whole system was collapsing, the only person who seemed to know what was going on, like the lobbyists didn't know, the treasury didn't know, it was a panicky period and everybody was like lost, right? But the one person who seemed to know was this old economist, her name was Jane Darista, and she was like, oh, this market is going to blow up now, and then it did. Oh, this derivatives market is going to blow up now, and then it did. And I was like, how do you know all this? And she's like, oh, you know, I saw the system of controls and protections get taken apart because I was a staffer for a congressman named Wright Patman in the 1960s, who was the chair of the banking committee and had fought to protect these protections. So a lot of people situate deregulation in 1970s and 80s with Carter, but it actually started in the 1950s. And Rick Patman was a player in preventing it from advancing until he was kicked out of office in 75. So Jane, you know, she had all this writing from the 80s and 90s about the problems of bailouts. And it was crazy. I was like, how did, we knew all of this stuff, but somehow it had not entered into the mainstream of discourse. So Jane taught me about this. And then a couple of years later, I got interested in monopoly power in 2011 or 12. And I learned about a, a law that had constrained chain stores right, like Walmart or Amazon, you know, they, we had that problem in the 1920s with a supermarket called A&P. And there was a law that was passed in 1936 called the Robinson-Patman Act that was also known as the anti-A&P law, which constrained A&P's power over farmers and workers and various other and communities. And I was like, wait a second, Robinson-Patman, that's Patman. That's like that guy 
that Jane told me about, who had fought against banking power in the 1960s and 70s. That's really interesting. And so I then realized, you know, I'd been trying to figure out what the relationship was between monopoly power and banking. And and then I said, oh, wait a second, this guy's life story does have something to say about it. And I think Patman, the tradition that he carried, which went back to Jefferson, which is this populist tradition against concentrations of both public and private power. So suspicion of government, but also suspicion of private government, which is to say monopoly. That was a tradition I had not heard of. It was a populist tradition. It was there's sort of left and right wing populist. But I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And that kind of answers a lot of the questions about why I think a lot of our institutional fabric has gone awry and wasn't always, you know, the left likes to say, oh, it's always been terrible and, you know, all the rest of it. And I, I didn't really believe that. I was like, oh, it's always been kind of a mess. But, you know, we built nice things somehow. We used to be able to do that. What happened? And so that this tradition really explained a lot of, of the world and why we've forgotten about some of the tools and practices that we used to use to constrain concentrated power, concentrated corporate power, concentrated financial power that let the rest of us be free and tinker and innovate and sell to each other, buy from each other, and really create a, a beautiful society. And we forgot about that tradition and we can bring it back. So there's so many questions that this raises. First, one of the things that I'm curious about is how important you felt your experience working in Congress was to your current understanding, the depth of your understanding of the system, of the structures of power. I know you worked for Alan Grayson. I remember Grayson. He was one of the anti-Fed populists, You know, one of those guys that was bashing the bankers during the financial crisis. And uh, I would lump him in with Ron Paul and a few of these other people who were very outspoken. What was that experience like? And what did you learn from that? And how important was that to you know where you are today? Yeah, Alan, Alan was a brilliant government contracting lawyer. He's a left-wing populist. So he was not, he didn't want to get rid of the Fed, but he thought that the Fed was, the way that it was operating was corrupt and was funneling capital or funnel, transferring or shifting wealth upward. And so we worked a lot with Ron Paul, who's on the right, who has a very different view of how to structure finance. But both Ron Paul and, and Alan thought that the Fed should be transparent in what it was doing. So we worked together on an audit of the Federal Reserve. And it really spoke to this sense that the establishment consensus of economists was really disdainful of transparency and just letting the public know what was happening. So the democracy itself, you know, kind of. And so while we disagreed on the ultimate ends of the institutions, I think both the populist right and the populist left at the time was saying, well, this shouldn't be in their hands. It should be in the hands of the people through our elections. Alan mm -hmm. was brilliant. It was so, there were parts of that period that were incredibly fun. There were times when it was, you know, just really miserable. But, you know, it's a great, Congress is a great place to work during a crisis. It's just, uh, I mean, depending on who you're working for, if you can working for somebody who's impatient and throws staplers at you, you know, it could be a nightmare. But it was really important. <laughs> That's yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah. It was really important in terms of my formative education of how power works. I think that, you know, there are a lot of people who have worked in Congress, but it was exciting to see how to make policy. It was exciting to make policy. I still do make policy. And I think it gave me, when I was going through those old, archives of Patman and a, a whole bunch of people around him. And I was reading hearings. You can kind of read between the lines because you know how the, the different pressures that are on members. I mean, yeah, Congress is different today than it used to be, very different than it used to be. But there's strong continuity in terms of just the institutional norms and just the different pressures on those politicians. And I gained a real respect for politicians and the political process. And I think that that actually really helped when I was trying to interpret how these guys were thinking and what they were doing and the arguments that they were putting forward. It, it gave me a sense for how to read a hearing and understand what was going on and read between the lines. Well, I was going to say that one of our former guests, Robert Johnson, the president of INET, recently launched a podcast. I, I highly recommend it to listeners. I think it's called Economy and... Or what is it called, Matt? You were on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember the name. Uh, there's so many anyway, it. but actually, I'll, I'll look at it while I'm asking you. But he, you, you were on his podcast. and I think Economics and Beyond. 
economics and beyond. You're right. And in fact, today he had Rana Faruhar on, another former guest. So listeners would love that podcast. Robert is fantastic. And that was a really great conversation. I think it was episode- He's a, he's a formal congressional staffer. Exactly, which is why I bring it up. So not only was he a congressional staffer, but he actually made a point in our conversation to emphasize how important that experience was in helping him understand the levers of power and how power shapes policy. And he brought up the work of Thomas Ferguson, and he had the opportunity to read Thomas Ferguson's Critical Realignment. It was his PhD thesis, and it was the subtitle was Decline of the House of Morgan and the Origins of the New Deal. And a lot of his work and the work of Ron Chernow on the House of Morgan, which I have read, was present throughout your book. Have you read Thomas Ferguson? Oh, yeah, of course. So how important was Ferguson? How important was Chernow's history of of the Morgan dynasty and of Rockefeller? I don't know if you've read Titan, also a great yeah, book. I have, I have. How important was that stuff in helping you? And how much did you rely on like source material for that book? Well, so... So there are different traditions. So Thomas Ferguson comes out of a different tradition than I do. There are disagreements and it's, so I really like Ferguson's work. I don't agree with it and I've I've used some of it. So Ferguson is much more of a kind of historical determinist type. He thinks, not quite this simplistic, but he kind of thinks that history has a logic to it and that, you know, dominant financial interests create politics and there's no, really democracy is a, little bit of a ruse, right, to mm-hmm. to put a sheen on top of financial interests. And I don't think that. I think that there's a lot of power in democracy and that it is ultimately what the people want that has a huge impact on how our political choices, you know, manifest themselves. So he'd probably look at Trump and he would say, this guy is, you know, don't look at Trump, the person, think about Trump as a collection of sort of donors, so private equity the back, the, and- ba- The financial the, interest backing the, him. Yeah, the, the private equity scumbags and then maybe some domestic you know, manufacturers. And I don't necessarily agree. And you know, I think that that stuff is important, but I don't think that it is determinative. So, you know, but I, I really enjoy his history. You know, a lot of the book is primary source material. So- you know, I spent a lot of time going through archives to understand the how Patman thought about the world, how Mellon, Andrew Mellon's a big character in my book, is the mm-hmm. rich guy, Treasury Secretary in the 1920s, how he thought about the world. I, you know, looked into how Robert Jackson thought about the world. And, you know, and then you read also these guys wrote books often and you read those, you read articles. You know, and I read a lot of speeches, of course. So a lot of the a lot of the work is rooted in, in primary source material, also newspapers and whatnot. But then, you know, secondary sources help you contextualize it and also have important and and useful information. But the piece that's mostly secondary sources, I had to do an opening chapter. The opening chapter starts in the mid 70s. And I think the preface is great. But chapter one brings you back to Teddy Roosevelt in 1910. And that is largely driven by secondary sources. It didn't do that much primary resource on the Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson just because what I really had studied in depth was was Patman in the 1920s through the 1970s mm-hmm. and then the junk bond guys in the 80s and stuff. But the I wrote the first chapter last because I had to write about Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson because that really framed the debate over how corporate America would look. That's the election of 1912. And that, that election cast a hundred year shadow. And so I had mm. to explain that. J.P. Morgan was involved in it and and there was a socialist named Eugene Debs, but it's not something, I mean, obviously I did some primary research for that, but it's not something that, yeah. like I didn't really, that's more context. Yeah, it's a fascinating history. And I'm also always fascinated at how people are able to write such enormous books with so much history. When I read Titan, I think, whether it was in the preface of the book or whether Chernow talked about it in another interview that he did, he discussed how he discovered or chanced upon some transcripts and notes written by an early biographer of Rockefeller who had been approved by the family while he was still alive, but who never published the work to interview John Dee. And this was hours and hours and hours of transcripts. And there was this one that stuck out in my mind where he talked about how there was only one person that elicited John Dee's fury, and that was 
the mention of Ida Tarbell. And, you know, that single fact, you can't get that anywhere else, right? I mean, those types of things, those insights are so important. They're so powerful. Anyway, I just it's a side note, but my mentioning of Thomas Ferguson wasn't just because Robert Johnson brought him up and because of the coincidence that you both worked at the Hill, but it was also because, you know, Ferguson talks about the importance of these blocks of major investors, right? But that also makes me think about a conversation that I had with Michael Lind on his book, The New Class War. And he was the first person that got me thinking about power as the issue that we have today versus an inequality in the distribution of wealth. He really stuck on this point about power. And he talks about it in terms of unions and, and a lot of other things. But is there a case to be made that one of the things that we need to start thinking about is how in order to counterbalance these powerful interests, these financial interests, there needs to be a reallocation of power more broadly across the society because individual workers and other people in the economy cannot form, whether you're using the investment theory of party competition framework or something else, cannot form countervailing forces or blocks of interests to counteract the interests of Wall Street or the military industrial complex, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I so the idea of power as a driving part of politics is I think it's really critical. And if you look at the libertarian framework from the 1970s onward, and I say libertarian, but you could call it neoliberal. There are weird left-wing parts of it too. So I'm not just this is not some right-wing. I'm not making a critique of the right. If you the look neoliberal, at the, the, the neoliberal, very fra neoliberal yeah, framework. The, the very neoliberal framework. It's about ignoring the idea of power. And I really like Michael Lind in his book, The New Class, where I think it's he's got a lot of interesting things to say. Although, again, he's part of the Tom Ferguson, Jamie Galbraith, Teddy Roosevelt style tradition called New Nationalism. And it's a, I have a very different tradition, but we both talk about power. What I think is important about how to understand our politics is to recognize that Technology and business structures are a result of social choices that work through bargaining among different blocks and different ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, you know, there was a venture capitalist today who talked about how the internet destroys mid sized businesses and creates, you know, natural monopolism for everything from retail to search to whatever. And I remember, and we got into an argument about it, and then it turned out to be really a nice conversation. And one of the interesting points that I made is that it's not that we have you know one search engine because there's some natural phenomenon about the market or about networks. We chose through our policies to have one search engine by getting rid effectively of antitrust in the early 1980s and then structuring a very neoliberal privacy framework, we made a series of policy determinations to centralize as opposed to decentralize power. How that manifests in any specific market is always looks different. But there's this real kind of temptation to just sort of talk about giant forces as if they have agency, right? The internet does this, or history will look back and say that. And it's part of this weird Marxist historical, you know, scientific history framework in which you sort of pull human agency out of the process, you pull policy out of the process. My view, and I think the view of a number of actors, and I know Michael Lind believes that power matters. I mean, my view is that these policy choices and the political choices we make shape the institutions and shape our businesses. That it's largely like the way we deploy technology is shaped by politics and shaped by power. And the institutions that we allow to emerge or not are a function of power as well. But I will say this, I do think that ideas really matter as well. And that's the other part of politics that I think it's hard to kind of get your mind around that, you know, when you deal with when and this is something, you know, in the crisis and this is I think where I dip part ways with Tom Ferguson, you know, I dealt with a lot of politicians and they are not driven by their donors. They are driven by their assumptions about the world and their biases, and they're driven by the education that they got when they were young. And the ideas do matter. The ideas 
shape but how cer- they think certainly about the their, their capacity to raise funding is essential, right? I mean, that's you're not saying that they don't take that into account, even subconsciously. No, I, I, of course, fundraising matters, but it's one of many choices. And there are different ways to raise money too, right? So when Obama was making a bunch of decisions about policy, right, during the financial crisis, and when I was dealing with all these people in the Democratic Party who were making policy choices about the bailouts and foreclosures, they were not kind of calculating what would be better for donors for fundraising. They were doing what they thought the right thing to do was. And so you would talk to me, you'd be like, hey, it's a really bad idea to have a whole bunch of foreclosures. And they weren't saying, oh, well, we need to help the banks so I can raise money, because it wasn't obvious that helping foreclosures would help, you know, fostering a foreclosure wave would help the banks, right? They were just going on instinct. And I think it's really easy to say, oh, well, you know, everyone's just bought off, right? That's what's going on here. But I think that's a lazy way of looking at the problem. And I also think it's an easy way to look at the problem. It's much harder to acknowledge that, in fact, people have ideas and that well-meaning people do bad things because they have bad ideas. That's a harder problem to solve. So to your point, are politicians like Marco Rubio, for example, or other members of the Republican Party who, after 2016 and the election of Donald Trump, radically changed, in some cases, their views on foreign policy, on domestic policy. Is that an example of decision-making that is not driven by financial interest or financial lobby or donors, but rather some complicated stew of, yes, certainly issues around electability, but also a direct response to the voters? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I think Marco Rubio got his ass kicked in 2016 by Trump. And, you know, that guy, when I first saw him, I said, oh, that guy is modeling his career off the most establishment Republican conservative movement, you know, model well, he, you he can was, do. He right? was a, like a disciple of Jeb Bush. Right. And he was trained in the conservative think tanks. And, you know, there's this well-greased path that has existed since the 1980s in the, you know, professional conservative movement where you go into this think tank, then you do this, you know, Paul Ryan, you know, did that whole thing, Right. Right mm-hmm. from his yeah, from totally. the teenage, I think he was a teenager. He went, you know, on through every institution, and then eventually became a House Speaker. And you know what Marco Rubio chose to do was step off of that framework, and he hired a different staff. He started to play with different ideas, including industrial policy, including taking on finance, including thinking about China differently. I mean, complete reversal in strategy around China, and he also, I think, has solicited a different donor base. So, you know, there are lots of different ways to win. There are lots of different ways to get money. There are lots of different ways to be corrupt and those are not corrupt. And those are just choices. So it's like part of the reason why I don't agree with the frame that everything is just deterministic by financial interest is because there are just a lot of financial interests and they don't agree with each other. And there are a lot of ways to be corrupt and you can choose the one that you want or you can not be corrupt and there are lots of ways to do that too it's there's there are multiple equilibria basically people have agency in terms of choosing which equilibrium they want the other point is that when i saw what obama was doing right and he made a bunch of choices that i think were wrong i don't think he made them because he's a bad guy or anything i think he just had some ideas and a history in his head those are bad ideas it's i think the history is not quite right but you know Fundamentally, he was supported by millions of people who shared his assumptions and ideas. And most of those people were not in the pocket of any particular financial interest. They were just people who had been persuaded to believe in a certain set of ideas. And they do. And I think that that's really the hardest thing to consider. You know, and I'm on the left, but, you know, the left has not had a good run for the last, you know, decade or so. We just keep getting crushed. But I think one of the reasons is because we have a tough time acknowledging that the ideas that we believe in, or at least, you know, know, however you want to frame it, are not ideas that are necessarily widely shared. I mean, I think there are particular strategies that you can use to address that. But I do think that, you know, it is not a question of corruption on the part of political elites. It's always very easy and seductive to say that because it's never your fault. And it's never the ideas didn't work or the ideas didn't sell. It's always the other guys. It's always, oh, the useful idiots or it's, oh, the media or, or, oh, it's our corrupt political establishment and the people really have wisdom. But sometimes, you know what, the people just don't agree with you, right? And I think, you know, you have to do a better job of persuading people or you have to reformulate your what you think or you have to learn new things, right? So that's kind of where I come at it from. 
Yeah, so this is super interesting, and this is kind of one of the major topics that I wanted to discuss with you, which has to do with both political parties. I mentioned it early on, this idea that we're at a crossroads where a new political consensus needs to be formed because many people, and I would throw myself in this camp, is totally disaffected with both political parties. Neither political party represents my views or my interests, and I feel like they're not really speaking to the larger issues. Forget even just my issues, the larger issues that unite us. So I wonder, if, from your perspective, what do both parties stand for? What do the Republicans stand for? And what do the Democrats stand for? I think that both of them are in flux. A party is just a bank account and a nominating process and a platform, right? That's all it is, legally speaking. So, you know, that doesn't stand for anything per se, it just by definition. Now, if you want to- But there's a brand, right? But these, each yeah, if of you these parties broaden, do you have a brand. You could broaden it out, right? What is a political party? A political party, at least the way I see it, is, you know, I just said gave a legal definition, but the like institutional definition is both political parties- are a set of loose networks of law firms and think tanks and kind of local notables in cities and states all over the country who form a kind of either you know governing apparatus or a shadow governing apparatus if they're out of power and you know those networks sometimes agree on basic principles and sometimes don't so if i were to say what is the democratic party you know, right now, I think you have a conflict in the Democratic Party. Most of the Democratic Party believes that it's, and this is going to sound weird, but they believe that politics should not touch commercial arrangements, right? So politics is a kind of television show in which you're supposed to be respectable and you're supposed to respect these things called norms and you know, they're deeply offended at Trump because he violates these norms in these sort of corruption, you know, oh, he fired What norms inspector. are you talking about? Because when most people think about norms, they think about social norms, but you're talking about something different. No, no, I am talking about social norms. Like, you know, they're very angry that Trump, you know, fired an inspector general who was looking into, you know, some aspect of his administration. Now- Or now, that he ridicules people, let's say Marco Rubio as- I forget what his nickname for little Marco, Marco Rubio right, was, right, but right. little Marco, right? That the fact that he's crass. That this yeah, is what that's concerns right. them more than that's the right. substance of his policies. That's right. right. They're frustrated that he doesn't sort of represent the elegant figure of the presidency, you know, the way that Obama did, or the way that now they perceive Bush felt. You know, where they're just like. But is that is, because he's disturbing with his presence? Their very comfortable system. And he's exposing through his own behavior the hypocrisy of the system. I mean, on some level, is that partly it? Well, I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm just trying to think because I had another thought in my head. I, I'm. Not, I'm trying to explain to you what they think. I mean, some <laughs> of the Democrats are upset about the policies, but a lot of Democrats don't actually think it's the job of policy of political leaders to make policy. They think it's the job of political leaders to sort of be symbolic representatives of society and of a and not to actually do anything about any problems in society. So, and allow you know, the large financial industrial interests to effectively to govern, run right, the government. Right, right, that's right. So you saw like when Trump says, talk shit about Amazon, right? You see a bunch of Democrats be like, you know, no, we need to protect Amazon from Trump. He's being an authoritarian. Or when Trump, the AT&T Time Warner merger, when Trump, you know, the antitrust division challenged it. You saw all these Democrats say, oh, well, this is outrageous. You know, I don't think this merger is necessarily a good idea, but like we have to let it go through because Trump is an authoritarian. But a better example, the probably the best example would be Trump's attacks on the press where he's just like makes fun of CNN. You know, it's like fake news or all this stuff, which is just like, it's really annoying because this press just wants to make themselves the story. So they love it when Trump attacks them and they feel like, oh, he's attacking the First Amendment when he attacks me. But it's really, he's making them the story. He's the pro wrestling villain. They're the pro wrestling heroes. Right, he's the, heel. he's the heel. He's the heel. But here's the, here's the interesting thing. Because of Google and Facebook's monopolization of the ad market, tens of thousands of journalists who gather news on a local level are no longer employed. So we've gutted the press across the country. Now, if Trump said... When he entered, I'm going to fire tens of thousands of journalists in local newspapers all over the country 
you would see this total anger at what an authoritarian is. He's destroying the free press, which he would if he did that. But because Google and Facebook have done it, or private equities kind of helped, people are just kind of like, well, that's just the market, right? That's just the way things work, right? It's a sort of strange, and I said, you know, it's a strange kind of libertarian worldview, although it's left flavored. Because people don't think about Democrats as libertarians, but that's neoliberalism, right? And they're just like, oh, well, that's just the way things work. That's just the internet. They may give all these like silly quasi- you know, historical, scientific historicism views. So they really, they're just like into symbolism. And that's not true for everyone in the Democratic Party. There is a, there are factions in the Democratic Party. I'm part of them that are, that are more focused on corporate power. I don't actually think the left is there anymore. I think the left is very confused. So what you saw with Bernie and Elizabeth Warren, who I think kind of represent different parts of the left in the Democratic Party, the bailouts came through a couple months ago for the, the pandemic. And both of, neither of them really, you know, opposed any of the stuff that the corporate goodies. So I think there is not. I'm not saying that this is like the left versus the center in the party because I don't think that's where the division really is. It's more motley. And I think the same thing is happening on the Republican side. The Republicans are more serious about power. Like they're really trying to govern. They're like, let me get the, my hands on the state so I can do things. But a lot of them are libertarian. They want to eliminate, you know, all sorts of rules. Like today, the Elaine Chao at the Department of Transportation is trying to get rid of all these protections over airlines. So, you know, when they destroy your bags, they have to give you compensation, or when they bump you off a flight, they have to rebook you. She wants to get rid of enforcement of all that stuff. And that's a serious use of state power. But then there are a bunch of new Republicans, you know, like Rubio is one, Hawley is one, then there's people a little bit like Tom Cotton, a couple of others that are actually saying, no, 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 we need to use the state to govern in real ways and that that whole Koch brother libertarian thing is not right. So there's a debate on the Republican side as well. And that's the, my analysis of both parties. So two big things that I want to separate here. One, you talked about the press. I really want to have this conversation because I see both sides of this issue. I see both what you just described. And then I also see a danger in the way that the president talks about the press. And one example of how I feel well, but, like- By the way, just to be clear, I do think the president is a symbol, right? And I don't think that you're totally wrong for saying the president's Symbolism matters, but I'm not saying that the Democratic Party people who think it's no, a no, sure, are crazy sure. I, I know, I understand, yeah. I understand, but I just want to make that point because when he talks, the issue is multifaceted. One it has to do with exactly the issues that you raised regarding monopoly and the types of regulations we have. The net neutrality regulations were dealing with physical information moving throughout the network. They didn't deal with the secondary layer of software that intermediates our experience of the internet right, with behavioral right. advertising algorithms. Right. So there's a, a lot of that gets into it and it creates a poor information environment. But today, just today, we're recording this on Friday, May 29th. I saw a video from Minneapolis where these enormous riots are going on. And it was a crew, a CNN crew with a reporter and the police just arrested him. Yeah. And I just think under no circumstances is that okay. Well, get into that, but and, and totally, sort of totally, totally. No, that all, was crazy. All my conversation. That, that was crazy. Absolutely. That. It was very freaky. It was very freaky. And you know, a lot of people love to push this idea out there that there are no such things as facts. It's a very postmodern, solipsistic idea that facts don't exist. And you know what? I'm willing to go on board with that insofar as I recognize that at bottom, I cannot account for the nature of this reality. I don't know what the nature of reality is. I don't know if it's all relativistic. But within reality's framework, within the sort of communally accepted consensus illusion or hallucination of reality, there are commonly accepted notions of truth and epistemological frameworks that we assess. And that's how we validate identity. And in the same way, we validate facts. And it's extremely important because people like you, me, and others who put in the time to make factually correct statements and be held accountable, that minimizes our work and it allows bad actors to proliferate in the environment. We'll, we'll get into that, but I, I want to actually bring it back to the Democratic Party and to something that you talked about. Well, you've talked about it in a number of interviews, but most notably in the conversation that you had with Robert Johnson. And both of you guys talked about it, but you were amazing, man. I heard this conversation with you, and that's why I was like, I got to have this guy on. I've never heard anyone talk like you did. And one of the things that you guys talked about is this kind of, you know, language of wokeness and how deeply offensive you find it. I find it similarly deeply offensive. It's highly moralistic. And identity politics and the way that identity politics has been substituted for conversations about 
power and the structures of power within the Democratic Party that are both more meaningful, more practical, and also more universal. You know, and then to bring it back again, and I'll, and I'll sort of let you run with this, to bring it back again, I believe it was the New York Post published an article today which showed a picture of two white guys in front of a store holding guns. And to the left of them, you couldn't see it, were two African-American gentlemen. And the title of the article was, you know, something like a couple of rednecks outside of a store, something like that. But what, what in fact it was, and it, so you got the impression reading it that this was a bunch of white guys, white nationalists, because that's the framing, who were exercising their white male privilege or, or however- They were these, holding these guns framings. too. Right, right. But ultimately, it, I don't know if you saw the article, did, but it was actually, yeah, it was all four of them working together. Well, they, well yeah, they, no, so, so just to explain, uh, you're right. I mean, the, the piece was, those two guys were like, yeah, we're here to stop the looting. And so it looked like if you were to look at the piece, you would say, oh, like white guys with guns are there to like- Yeah, like fight LA riots the, fighting, framing. Right, fighting against the people that are trying to like protest police injustice. But actually these guys, what they said, and if you watch the video and if you read the article, what they were saying is, yeah, we're here- because we think that the looting is wrong and the riots are wrong, but we support the protesters and we want justice for George Floyd. So yeah. it was like a and really so the title, dynamic. by the way, the title for listeners, Armed Rednecks Defend Stores from Looters Amid George Floyd Protests. Right. And you read that and it immediately incites racial division. When in fact, what we need in this country is unity. And this is like, uh, you know, I, I think this is... Yeah, well, sorry. Let, let, I, let, me, it, let me just get it, into it. I'll, get, I'll, I'll, get, I'll yeah. get into this for a second because I think that we have to acknowledge, you know, obviously there's a massive amount of structural racism. And, you know, being black in this country is just a different experience and a much more stressful and dangerous 100%. experience than being white or, you know, other other ethnic groups. And, you know, and I, I am Jewish, right? And I always see people who are Jewish, you know, and it's, it's like a standard trope in politics to get really offended in anti-Semitism. You know, and anti-Semitism is bad, but, but like, there's just no comparison between being Jewish and being black. Like, if you're Jewish in this country, you have the white experience. And if you're black in this country, you don't have the white experience. You get treated very differently. But there's an attempt to claim the sort of moral legitimacy of that kind of black victimhood or black victim sort of status. Now, there's a lot in there. I'm going to unpack what I just said, because my problem with woke language is that it, it actually ignores racism and it ignores anti-racism in favor of what I think it really is, which is an in-group signaling mechanism. Me mechanism for fellow aristocrats, right? So if you, you know, I went to Harvard, right? I went, lived in all of these like fancy white worlds. And I, so I learned to talk about privilege and all of this other discourse. But like that takes a lot of time and effort to actually learn. And the whole point of it is not to say I actually care about racial justice or injustice. It's to just show that you know that language too. And then if you don't know that language, everyone, you know, around you who does know it is like, well, that person is just terrible. We must cast them out. And that's not right. actually about addressing problems because to really address a social problem, it should be okay to make a mistake and for other people to be, you know, it should be okay to talk about this stuff in sort of normal in normal ways. And I think what we saw during the primaries, for example, is that Joe Biden had a very clumsy or perceived clumsy way of talking about race and you know, a bunch of the other candidates had much more sort of sophisticated, woke ways of talking about race. And Joe Biden ends up winning the whole black vote because, you know, black people are just people. And they're not like, you know, yeah. Democratic <laughs> voters are just like, we don't like all of this elitist crap. And I think that that's like what is going on here. It's not that we're denying racism or you're promoting racism or whatever. It's that the real problems of race have to do with power. And if you want to address police violence and police brutality, which is a very serious and systemic problem in America, and it is a racial problem, you have to go into not just whether you know, people are racist in their heart or bigoted in their heart, which is a very minor part of the problem. You have to go into the institutions themselves. You have to actually look at the details of how police are trained, the jobs they're given, you know, because being a a the cop, protocols they the have protocols in place. They have to follow, you know, the bureaucratic incentives. Like being a police officer is a job. And there are, like any job, I'm guessing there are a lot of people that are, you know, mediocre at it. There are a lot of people that are 
good at it and there are a lot of people that are bad at it. And some of them are good people that want to help and serve and some of them are asshole bullies from high school. And I'm sure, you know, that's just the way everything is. So why is it that in a lot of the world you have police that don't do what our police do or in some parts of the world you have police who do who are worse than what, what our police do? Why is it in some parts of the country the police operate right. in one way and in other parts they operate in other ways? And then, you know, look, I mean, in some parts of this country, it's dangerous and it's scary, right? So, you know, you have to look into the bureaucratic details and try to figure out what the right way is to address the problem. And I think that that's like the way that we need to kind of move forward on this. And, you know, it's hard, though, because there is there is so much racism and there is so much demonization of people that are trying to, you know, make the point. I mean, I've been in protests and they're not covered fairly. And, and then I also think that like with the riots, and I'm not romanticizing violence because I think the riots are are bad. I and mean, I think that this violence is bad, but riots don't just happen in a vacuum. They happen for social reasons. And so you do have to look at like, why is it that these people are rioting? Why do they not feel like they have no stake in society and that destroying things is is something that they, you know, feel like is in their interests. And you, you do have to understand that. And it's like, we have to get beyond the incendiary rhetoric on that denies 100%. these problems, right? A hundred percent. But I think to your point though, talk is cheap. Action is what matters. Yeah, that's true. It's very easy to talk about civil liberties and to talk about racism and to talk about these things. Let's act on those things. Yeah. You need to actually reform the criminal justice system. You need to actually implement and enforce proper protocols for right. police departments. But but I want to actually just bring up one more because I, I spent today really immersed in this news cycle. I found that scene in particular that I mentioned, and we'll get back to it with the CNN crew, so incredibly disturbing. And like everyone with a, a normal conscience and empathy watching the death of George Floyd, and the way that he was suffocated, I found that incredibly, incredibly outrageous, okay? So, but I spent the last few days kind of following the story. Here's another story, and this kind of gets to my point about the two sides of media. On the one hand, you have people that are doing honorable work with high integrity, trying to check facts, and they are being attacked both by this president with his language and the general consensus by many, many millions of people that media is fake news, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the other hand, you've got people in media at established media outlets, in this case, like Vox. This guy's got 400,000 Twitter followers. I won't mention his name, but he published an article and it was based off of a video of Kevin Hassett outside the White House being interviewed on television. And Kevin Hassett made a reference to our human capital stock. Okay. So capital stock is an economic term. And in the context of how he said it, it actually sounded a little weird, but he basically said that our human capital stock needs to get back to work. And this author wrote, White House economics advisor Kevin Hassett went viral over the weekend for referring to American workers as human capital stock, a racially charged, dehumanizing turn of phrase that conjured up images of livestock. Now, this guy wrote what I think is an incendiarily racist article that no person watching that video would think along those terms unless he or she was racist. You'd have to be racist to derive a racial connotation from what this guy said. And so I feel like what we have is this media environment that has really focused in various ways. Race is one of them, gender, sexuality. There are all sorts of other isms and identities that people are focused on. And that focus not just diminishes racism, which is a serious systemic problem in our country, but it also divides our citizens and makes it increasingly difficult for us to come to the types of political solutions that we need to in order to move through a very difficult period. Well, you know, it's funny, that phrase, the human capital, right? One of the things about in Goliath, I go over this sort of ideological transformation in the 1970s. And I'll just say, like, saying human capital, I've always thought it's weird but it's not like a right-wing economist thing or it's an economist thing, right? We talk, we well, should just, just like talk about- just like referring to citizens as consumers. Right, well, yeah, right. I mean, it's like, we don't talk about bridges, we talk about infrastructure, right? This change happened in the 1970s where we started using this weird flabby new language, like human capital instead of people or workers and bridges instead of infrastructure and public-private partnerships instead of government subsidies, like that kind of thing. And I do think that you know when Kevin Hassett gets up there and talks about how our human capital stock is eager to get back to work, it's weird and creepy, but it's also just like normalized language that we've been using in since the 1970s and particularly the technocrats and the economists because they actually, they want to hide what they're doing. 
right? So to have the like- to, Well, you say, brought up that great speech by Janet Yellen where she talked about heterogeneity right. in the context. I mean, it's a, good, it's a great, Fed speak is the ultimate I know, it's, whitewashing yeah. of humanity. Right. And so, <laughs> so to take that and to sort of be like, you know, your jargon, I'm going to like take your jargon and I'm going to make it into my jargon, which is the sort of, you know, obviously this is just, you know, racism. I didn't read that piece, but- you know, whatever I can imagine. It's it's just, in some ways, it's like taking, using the language of sort of a particular social justice jargon, which is a different exclusionary method than what, you know, the, this economist was doing, but it's an exclusionary method nonetheless. It's not intended to speak to a broad audience. It's intended to speak to 100%. particular, you know, Vox readers. And I think that that's like one of the reasons that, you know, I don't know how to address this problem because we as a society, we've sort of, I don't want to say we've lost the ability to think, and I don't want to be in one of those dynamics where you're like, oh, kids these days, they wear short skirts and they, they watch the new TV. But there is a a deep kind of sense of an overpassioned sense of how we talk about politics because we're not talking about power. And that's what's really going on there. It's like Kevin Hassett is an idiot. I know him. He's just dumb. And I don't know why that guy, you know, he's got a PhD. Why do we care what he has to say? Why is he making important decisions about allocating resources in the White House just because he has a PhD and is sort of socially dysfunctional and knows how to do math? Like, that's a crazy way to run a society. And I think that's a more interesting question. Like, why are economists in charge of important decisions, even though they're like systematically wrong in favor of the powerful and have been for decades? That's an important question. And we should really talk about that. And we should really try to put a different set of institutional actors in charge of our institutions. To me, that's a much more interesting question. I, I think it's a much more important question than the specific whether that particular Vox article framed it as. So that's the way that I think about these problems. And it's one of the reasons. So my book, Goliath, and then my newsletter, you know, I try to take these questions, right? And I try to translate them into language that normal people can understand. You know, I don't think that I'm dumbing stuff down. I think that I'm demystifying stuff that's intentionally obscured and hidden, right? When Janet Yellen talks about heterogeneity of the monetary transmission channel, what she's saying is <laughs> it's harder for poor people to borrow than it is for rich people to borrow, right? That's what she's saying. And everybody knows that. But like when she talks about heterogeneity in the monetary transmission channel, Fox News is not going to go after her and no one is going to pay attention to her except the 30 economists that run the world. And that's the whole point. And so what I try to do is try to take that language and say, here's what they're really saying. And, you know, when people get it, right, we all experience the world as it is. You know, I wrote this piece on cheerleading and it's, it's like cheerleading is way overpriced because of the way that Varsity runs the business. And everybody in the cheerleading world knows that. And just laying out, here's what they do, here are the different tactics, here's the law. People were, you know, they were just like, oh, okay, this actually explains it all. And it's like, that's actually what's missing in our culture is just sort of describing the institutions of power, which are normally businesses, which normally have market power. That's really the key to restoring what I think is a free society, is to just explain how we make things, how we sell things, how we interact with one another in a commercial sense. And then how the law influences that. And then how if we want a different set of arrangements, we can do that through the law. And that's, I think, just what's missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What are the, by, by the way, I will say that if we broke up the banks, it would really help our race relations. Because yeah, the banks do. <laughs> they did a lot of really bad things. And it's not because they're necessarily, the bankers themselves are racist. It's because they're predators, or at least they, the ones that are, were in charge, are predatory and they prey on people without power. And in America, black people have less power. So they're the first people to get preyed on. You know, So yeah, this is if you think about race in terms of power, then absolutely, commerce is really important. You know, this isn't the first time that we've gone through this type of cycle. We went through a similar one in my own lifetime that I remember. And I'm not even going back to the 90s and the the Republican Revolution and all that stuff. I'm actually going back to the Bush era, where during the Bush administration, in the early part of the Bush administration, when he could do no wrong, when the country was united against the external threat and the external enemy, when everyone on television was wearing a lapel pin, mm -hmm. one of the tropes that was very similar to the way that authors like this will pretend that they want to fix or the pro uh, systemic racism in the country but instead really are just signaling to an in-group. Similarly, we had the support the troops meme, right? The way that 
people in the media and politicians talked about our troops in the early 2000s was meant to basically stifle debate. You couldn't actually have a meaningful debate about the war because every time you wanted to talk about the war, you had to make sure that it was very clear that you support the troops, right? And so like, I think we do this all the time. And I think on some level, I don't know how this stuff gets generated, Matt. You know, I, I imagine that there are a lot of think tanks, partisan think tanks that participate in this debate, people within the government do as well, where they help shape the framework of discourse in order to advance their agendas. But I think that this is part of it as well. But I, I, anyway, I think it's incredibly destructive and it's very moralistic and it's demeaning and it doesn't help us. Look, Matt, I want to move it into the overtime. And there are so many more things I want to talk about with you. I want to spend that in the second hour. Donald Trump recently came out with I think he tweeted it. He talked about it. The White House released a statement about it, that he wants to prepare an executive order intended to curtail the legal protections that shield social media companies from liability for what gets posted on their platforms. Right. Section 230. I want to talk about this because you've been tweeting about it. I want to get your opinion on it because I also want to have a larger conversation about what can be done or what should be done to regulate big tech. In particular, these platforms that engage in what Shoshana Zuboff talks about as surveillance capitalism, something we've talked about on this show. I think something needs to be done. This is impacting our discourse and there are sort of many dimensions to it. I want to continue what we were talking about up until now. I also want to talk about the Joe Rogan Spotify deal. That's something that you've written about. I think it's really interesting. My original take on that was different, but when I read your take on it, I thought it was actually the, the much more relevant, interesting take. And I also want to have perhaps a larger conversation about neoliberalism, yes, but also how the way that we think about our country, the fact that we sanitize it and we think about it very much in economic terms, how this has contributed to an obsession with efficiency and efficiency in place of building resiliency. And how we've seen this, for example, in the recent crisis with COVID-19, we saw it in the 2008 financial crisis, we're seeing it again in the economy. So all of these things I wanna talk about. For regular listeners, you know the drill. If you're new to the program or if you haven't subscribed yet to our audio file, Autodidact or Super Nerd Tears, head over to patreon.com slash hidden forces or scroll down to the summary section of this week's episode and click on the link that sends you to the Hidden Forces Patreon page, where you can continue to listen to my conversation with Matt, including gaining access to the transcript, rundown, and notes to today's conversation. The rundown is full of links to many of the things we already covered in the first hour, including images and screenshots of some of the tweets and articles discussed. I hope you guys will join us. Matt, Stick around. We're going to move the second part of our conversation into the overtime. Great. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.